Hello again, everybody. Welcome back to Accounting 1101. I'm Professor Martin. In our video today, we're going to be talking about our accounting rulebook. Now, believe it or not, accounting isn't really a profession where we like a lot of creativity. Uh, creative accountants are usually the ones that go to jail or end up costing their uh, companies a lot of money. So we're going to try to avoid being creative and doing accounting our own way and wildcatting it. And we're going to follow a good accounting rule book when we do our accounting. Our video today is going to give you a little bit of background on what that accounting rule book is. Before we get into that, though, I want to take a step backwards. In our video before, we talked about uh, profit. We talked about how businesses were set up to earn a profit. Now, I've got what we call an income statement up here. And we'll get into income statements later on, but I have the income statement for Apple up here. And you can kind of take a look at that with me. You can see right here we have net sales at the top or what Apple got from its customers when they sold an iPhone or an iPad or whatever they happen to sell. Then below that, you can see they've got something called cost of sales and they've got expenses. In other words, what Apple paid for the input. Cost of the product, all the labor involved, all the overhead, all that good stuff. And then down here at the bottom, we have net income or profit. So like we talked about in our very first video, a business is set up to earn a profit. They do that by taking input, assembling them or transforming them into a product or a service, and then they sell it to a customer who pays for it. So what Apple got paid for its products and services minus what they had paid for them gives us a profit. Now, take a look at the numbers here. They're pretty mind boggling. These are all stated in millions. Apple sold in 2022 394 billion dollars worth of products and services billion with a b all right you can see what they paid for them all the expenses involved you subtract that out they made a profit of 99.8 billion that's profit y'all dollars in the pocket billion with a b crazy all kinds of profit being generated by apple there so we need a rule book to help us keep all of that straight. Why do we need a rule book for? Well, first of all, if we have a good rule book, I know exactly how Apple came up with the numbers involved here. When they say they sold $316 billion worth of product, I have an idea of how they came up with that number and the rules they followed to get to that number. I can also compare it to other companies. Let's say I wanted to compare Apple with my phone manufacturer, Google, and kind of see how the two look compared to one another, I can do that because they're both following the exact same rule book. So if I'm going to invest in a company and maybe I'm comparing one company to another, it's very beneficial for me to be able to do that and know that the comparison is apples to apples and not apples to bananas. And then finally, we can punish Apple or any other company if they break the rules. I can't punish a company if there's no rule book, right? And so having a rule book and making sure everybody is playing by the same rules means that if somebody gets out of line, the SEC can come in and punish them for not following the accounting rule book. So very important to have an accounting rule book. We call our accounting rule book GAP. GAP stands for Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. All that means is we have a collection of accounting standards, principles, and assumptions that define how financial information will be reported to the public. And pretty much every business follows GAP. Unless we're talking maybe a small business that does kind of cash basis accounting, all your companies that are publicly traded follow GAAP, and many companies that aren't publicly traded also follow GAAP, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. GAAP is kind of overseen by an organization called FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, who have been given the blessing of the SEC to create accounting laws for our country and accounting rules for the country. So that's where we are. We have GAAP. GAP is the baby of FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board. And you can actually get on your computer 
and you can look up the GAP codification. And if you can see right here, if we go to FASB.org slash standards, it will take you to the accounting standards codification. Now, personally, I'm an accounting nerd. I've got it bookmarked. You can see right here in my internet, right? I've got FASB codification bookmarked. That's some next level accounting nerddom right there. You all probably have, you know, maybe Netflix bookmarked, maybe your Amazon uh, bookmarked on your bookmark bar there. Uh, we are not the same. I am full on accounting nerd. Maybe you'll get to that point one day. Uh, if you do get to the point where you have bookmarked the FASB codification, reach out to me and tell me. It makes me a little bit misty eyed to know that I have a student who has bookmarked the FASB codification. If you go to the GAP codification, you can kind of see it's broken down into different areas. And we'll talk about these different areas as we move along in our class time together. But just clicking on the very first one, general principles, you can see right off the bat, the very first piece of codification in the standard says this topic establishes FASB codification as the authoritative source of GAP recognized by FASB to be applied to all non-governmental entities. So this is just for non-governmental for-profit businesses, these standards. Governmental entities have a whole different set of standards that they're going to follow, which are you know, similar to what we're going to be looking at in our class, but there's some differences in between the two. As I mentioned, the Securities and Exchange Commission of the U.S., kind of is given the blessing, their blessing to FASB to operate and develop the standards. Every now and then the SEC might put out something, uh, but for the most part, GAP comes from FASB. So that's our accounting rule book. When I get into accounting later on, we're talking about specifics of how to account for a transaction. Just be aware that what I'm telling you, I didn't just make it up. Uh, it comes from GAP. It comes from generally accepted accounting principles. So that's kind of what we're getting at with our rule book. We're talking about GAP. Now, the goal of accounting, the goal of accounting and why we have GAP and why we do accounting is to provide useful information for decision making. As I mentioned earlier, if I'm thinking about buying Apple stock, I need to know if the company's doing well. I need to know if they're profitable. I need to know what they own and maybe what their debts are. I need useful information so I can make an informed decision about buying or selling Apple stock. In order to be useful, that information has to be relevant to the decision and it has to be faithfully represented. Now what that means, relevant means it has to be relevant to the decision I'm making. I'm sure an accountant could put together a report on how many people that work for Apple are named Rebecca. That really wouldn't be relevant for me in my investment decision making. So the information has to be relevant to me in my decision making process. It also has to be faithfully represented, meaning that it's accurate and there was a good faith effort in compiling that information to make sure that it is correct and accurate. It's faithfully represented. It's not biased to any one particular group or user. Some characteristics of that. What does that look like? You can see in our final little uh, column here, we have characteristics of relevant and faithfully represented information. First of all, one characteristic would be it's comparable. As I mentioned before, I can compare Apple to Google, to Amazon, to other companies. And I can also compare Apple from year to year. I can look at last year, the year before, the year before that, and compare those and see what the trends are and how Apple's doing over the past you know, three, four, or five years. It's comparable. That is relevant information if I can compare it between companies and between years. It's also verifiable. As I mentioned before, I know how the rules work. I can verify that the rules have been followed in the accounting. Another characteristic is the information is timely. I can get Apple's uh, results for the year or for the quarter a few weeks after the year or quarter has ended. I don't have to wait five years to get accounting information. If I did, it wouldn't be worth anything. And so it, the information has to be timely. It has to get into the hands of the user in a time frame that allows them to make a relevant decision. And then finally, it has to be understandable. And the reports have to be made in a way that are kind of standardized and people with a little bit of background in business and accounting can read them and understand what they mean and then act on them. So our rule book has rules 
It has characteristics. It also has some assumptions baked into the rule book in GAP. Four main assumptions I want to talk about real quick. First of all, there's a monetary unit assumption. We're assuming a single monetary unit in our financial statements. In the United States, that unit is a dollar. You're not going to find the uh, financial statements for Apple half stated in dollars and half stated in pesos and then part of it stated in yen, okay? We're using a single monetary measurement in the U.S. and that is a dollar. We're also assuming that that monetary unit is stable. We're not baking in any inflation. The dollar is the dollar. So we're not manipulating things to kind of factor in inflation. We're just kind of assuming that the dollar is stable, even though there's a little bit of inflation going on right now, of course. Uh, we're not really adjusting financial statements from quarter to quarter, or year to year to reflect that inflation. We're just counting the dollars involved. There's a time period assumption. Our accounting reports are going to be uh, created assuming a certain time period. In uh, publicly traded companies, the time periods are quarterly and annually. Apple will release a quarterly financial report, and they'll do that four times a year, and then they'll release an annual report that covers the entire year. So there's a time period assumption. There's a business entity assumption where we view the business as its own separate thing apart from the owners of the company. So taking Apple as an example, once again, Apple is its own thing. If I own shares of Apple as an owner, my personal finances are separate from Apple itself. Apple doesn't count my checking account in their billions of dollars in cash. We're two separate things. Uh, unfortunately for me, I can't count Apple's billions of dollars in cash in my own records either. Uh, separate there. And then finally, we have a going concern assumption. And that simply is the assumption that the business will continue on into perpetuity. Perpetuity is a fancy word that means forever. All right, we're assuming that the business will continue on and on and on and on. The reason we make that assumption is for valuation purposes. If we can't assume the business is going to go on and on and on, and we know the business is going to go under within uh, the next month or whatever, then we got to do some tweaks on the valuation of some of the things that we have on our balance sheet and the assets that we have. And we'll get into that later on. But for now, just be aware that we're kind of assuming that the business is going to be around for a while. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. We got rules, we got characteristics, we got assumptions. We also have principles. Principles are a little bit better to be discussed as we kind of come up in the accounting for a different thing. So I'm going to pull these in later on. We're going to talk about these right now. Uh, but principles like measurement and historical cost and revenue recognition, we're going to talk about those as we get into the actual accounting. Speaking of which, we've made a lot of words and I've done a lot of talking. We haven't really done any accounting yet. We talked about the nature of business. We've talked about the accounting rule book. Let's do some accounting. I'm itching to get going here and actually put some numbers up on the screen and walk you through how we do actual accounting. So we're going to start getting into that into our next video. Probably one of the most important videos that we're going to do. We're going to talk about something called the accounting equation. Very important. I encourage you to come back for that video. As always, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to help. Reach out and uh, we'll see if we can get you on the right accounting path. Accounting equation coming up. Until then, take care, everybody.